but really the rich. Oh, good. So, <laughs> so, so Cooper Anderson. But as a, as president, he's really done a great job of carrying on what I think is a a really positive. Um, even I think Kenny would, would agree. I mean, he was president of the association. He strived to just improve participation. We've seen growth every year, just about getting through all of these difficulties like the pandemic. Um, but it's just shocking. When I first started coming to CAOA uh, conferences, there were probably 40 or 50 people at some of those conferences. And we're, here we are at 250 at this conference. It's a beautiful location. So I just wanted to say thanks to all of the, the board members, but also the past um, presidents that have just shared in, in getting us here. Uh, to a, a really good organization. Thank you. That's, that's part. Here, here, Trendy. Chair, sure. I'm Trendy, and uh, this was such a great conference. It's beautiful here, and it's great to see all you guys here year after you know year after year having these conferences. Exciting for Steamboat next year. That's going to be great too. Um, speaking of like, you know, we did the national anthem and. You know, it's D Day, right? Today is D Day. And my son's in on Omaha Beach right now for the D Day celebration. And um, it, it, it means a lot. You know, we, we give our Pledge of Allegiance, and it just made me realize wow, my son's standing in Omaha Beach right now uh, for D Day. So it just kind of hit me. Um, and also, it's great to see Roy Romer because he came out to Julesburg, where I grew up. And uh, I was, I think, in high school the first time I met him. And I think he knew. Um, somebody in, in Julesburg in the aviation community back then. So that, that's really cool that he's here. Um, so my pilot organization's report is, I'm going to kind of keep it shorter today than typical. Um, but I do want to let everybody know, you know, we've got this beautiful high country. We fly in it. Um, the, the risks of hypoxia are huge. Uh, we glide in it, don't we? And the hypoxia risk is huge. So in two weeks, the FAA is coming. And uh, thank you, Mike Cronenfell, for hosting us at Centennial Airport and Wings of the Rockies for hosting um, the FAA Academy. Uh, aeromedical and survival instructors are coming and they're going to allow us to all get hypoxic. So if you would like to get hypoxic, there are still a lot of openings on Thursday. So a week from yesterday is when it will be starting. And um, Saturday's packed out, but between Wednesday and Saturday, um, I have openings on, on Thursday and Friday. So if you're interested in getting a hypoxic or you just want some information, talk to me <clears throat> a little bit later and I can give you the link directly to it. Um, the FAA hypoxia chamber is called the Portable Reduced Oxygen Training and Closure. It takes about a half an hour. You come and meet the guys, they talk to you about hypoxia. Uh, you meet the four other people that you're going to be in your flight with. Uh, you get a hypoxic, and then you're reviewed. Um, they, they just make sure you're okay before they send you off. But you can also fly in. You can fly in, get a hypoxic, and fly back out. Um, so we have a few. I'm going to let Mikey, I'll let you know so you can tell Tower how many are to expect to fly in. But um, great opportunity, only half an hour in time. And uh, so talk to me about that later. And, uh, it'll be the third time that they've come here. And they're really funny guys. They're super hilarious. So it, it, it's worth it just to hear their, their sense of humor while they're giving their survival and um, their survival instruction. Um, and that's my report for today. Thank you. Thank you, Trini. Mark. Well, first off, I want to say also thank you to CAOA and for, um, for today and, and, uh, and tomorrow. This is a, a great event and it's an honor to be here and a great opportunity for us to, to talk about um, what's going on in, in the aviation world. And of course, uh, May 16th was an important day for aviation in both for the state and for the nation, maybe for the world, when uh, uh, President Biden signed the uh, 2020 period, signed the FAA Reauthorization Act for five years, um, which uh, authorizes more than $105 billion uh, for the FAA um, 
from 2024 through 2028. So finally, we don't have uh, to worry about this year by year. We have some stability that um, uh, that the FAA will experience and will impact us uh, through through the next five years. Um, that also authorized, by the way, $738 million for the NTSB and some overhauls that need to be done there. A lot of in this bill was um, is important to us, um, especially at the state level um, and at the general education level. Uh, Brad Schuster uh, pointed out some of those in his presentation if you got to see that uh, before lunch. Uh, but uh, including that uh, $4 million uh, for uh, FAA um, AIP uh, spends of which are about a billion dollars that is going to go to uh, GA funding for GA airports. Uh, the Airman's Medical Bill of Rights, uh, which is really, really important in the expansion of basic meds. So, the, you know, the, there's a number of things if you look at the bill around general aviation uh, that through the help of uh, people like Congressman Sam Grace and others that really focused on aviation were, were included. You know, key to us in Colorado were some um, uh, some segments of that um, reauthorization that we need to pay attention to. Uh, one of them, the reauthorization bill, uh, pointed out that um, that the FAA is to protect U.S. civilian interest, aviation interests by rejecting permanent closures of any grant obligated airports unless the closure is significantly impairs the, unless the closure does not significantly impair uh, the aeronautical purpose of the airport. And of course, you know, there's um, activity and conversations going on east of here uh, about that, uh, that very thing. Um, also, the uh, act included uh, specific uh, provisions related to unleaded fuel. Um, and one of those uh, author, uh, one of those highlights was the authorization for U.S. airports, our airports, uh, to use AIP funding for unleaded fuel infrastructure, and uh, you know that's a, a very very uh, significant thing for for us again in in Colorado as we go forward. Uh, the one thing that it does, does require, which is interesting, is that. Um, it was 100 low lead availability. The act requires airports to offer um, 100 low lead uh, gasoline sales. If they sold uh, 100 low lead in 2022, then they are required to continue to offer the sale of 100 low lead um, until either 2030 um, or uh, the date in which the FAA certifies unleaded, unleaded uh, aviation gas alternative um, that's available for purchase. And for G Air, and when Chris uh, speaks here a little later from Swift, I uh, you know that he had addresses that. So uh, the provision didn't include uh, <laughs> the, the provision did not cover airports in Santa Clara County, California. So all of us who are aware of what's going on out there um, can understand that. So um, clearly, I want to make sure that you know we say here that the, the cab and the vision. Fully support the industry's um, ongoing efforts to transition to a safe fleet-wide um, unleaded ab gas. That's, uh, there's no question to that. But keeping in mind again that higher performance aircraft um, are going to uh, are going to be required to uh, have higher octane unleaded fuel to be able to support their operations. Uh, that's a key. And uh, right now the concern at different Types of unleaded gas may not be mixed together. So um, that is a concern. And of course, first and foremost, we're focused on safety um, and the safe adoption of that new fuel. So that issue needs to be resolved. Um, the cap and the state cannot mandate um, aviation fuel use. That really um, happens at a, at a local level, at an airport level, um, and something that I know everybody is, is working on. So the good news is that under the current statutes that uh, we operate under the cap, the division operate under, um, we can assist Air Force with funding unleaded infrastructure. And again, money is there at a federal level uh, that um, as long as that fits with the program um, priority. So uh, a lot in that reauthorization, a lot that we need to pay attention to, a lot uh, that, that um, become part of the conversation we're having 
about unlead, uh, about lead and lead and fuel, about noise uh, and other issues uh, uh, that are very prevalent in our region that they saw. Um, the, the gap is ready to uh, we will continue to support our constituents and their focus on um, promoting aviation around the state. So that's my report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to quickly echo um, what Trivi was, was talking about with the Sea Chamber. I've been to the uh, Sea Chamber twice now, and if you're an aviator, it's a really powerful experience to learn what your own personal symptoms are with hypoxia and that kind of thing. And she mentioned it's really fun. So when I've been to the one in Oklahoma City uh, twice now, and you know, they pass around one of those boxes with the shapes and they put the blocks in there and you get to watch what you're wearing a mask. You watch the other people try to figure it out and see what their symptoms are. And it's a it's a really uh, really good experience and especially for your own personal, you know, what your own symptoms are and when you show symptoms differently at different rates. And so I highly recommend the out seat chamber for anybody that uh, that would want to try it. So um out on the eastern plains we are in construction season, they say in Colorado there's two seasons: winter and construction, and uh, that's kind of how we are right now in all these little airports and, and on the eastern plains. I mean, we've got uh, uh, working on the tax replacement plan, and and you. Um, another exciting thing about you, but they've got a, a deal. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, which would be a lot of fuel sales for them with a big shot in that airport. So I'm hoping that they have a chance to work with the military there. Um, Charlie Charlie is there. got a ramp project going on. Um, Fort Morgan's got a neighborhood expansion that they're working on. Uh, talk to Luke um, at Ohana. They've got uh, Vassy lights that they're getting put in at the moment. Um, lots of individual things going on. Uh, Dr. Greg out in Pueblo, they uh, have a runway rehab and uh, and uh, taxiway project to get the phenomenon. Sure, everybody's known by now. Unfortunately, we didn't get the air races, but uh, I know we were all sure cheering for you. And, so uh, it's a shame, but uh, we move on. So, uh, Meadow Lakes got a payment maintenance project coming up. Um, uh, Jeff at uh, CFO wanted to uh, make sure everybody knew there's a fly in for the 40th anniversary uh, for uh, CFO. It's always going to be front range in my brain, so I have to like convert that when I'm going to say it. Um, so uh, they, it's a 40th anniversary on uh, June 29th, um, and then on September 5th, they're having a big dinner for the, I guess, the actual 40th anniversary um, that's going to be hosted at the Museum of Nature and Science. Um, you know, family fun day on the 7th, um, and then the, just as far as projects go, they've got some uh, Fog seal, some repaint projects going on. And out in Burlington, we've got a big, big, busy year coming up. We've got a taxiway uh, reconstruction project. We're getting a uh, backup generator, some real lights. And um, on top of that, our education outreach program is going, up, going pretty busy. We've got 70 some kids coming here in the next 30 days. So we're hoping, Teddy, to break the 500 kid in the simulator mark this year. With the simulator, just, just this month is. One year that we've had that simulator, so we're really excited about that. We're working with Falcon Air Lab. Hopefully, get some kids out, um, get some airplane rides, and do some some more simulator and some some uh, exciting things with that. So, so we're just uh, we're just going pretty pretty busy out there. And that's all I have, Mr. Thank you, Daniel. Um, in Utah, the Bears Ears. National Monument Resource Management Plan came out recently, and in that plan, something like 13 backcountry strips would no longer be open, and only two would be left available. The monument designation was so huge that it almost reaches to Moab, so a lot of the strips there uh, would be lost. Um, I say that because there's uh, murmurs of a Dolores National Monument. And the maps that are floating around out there are about one half of Western Colorado. So uh, there are a lot of our resources that, that could be at risk. So I encourage everyone to keep an eye out for that. And I'll, I'll uh, close my remarks with that. So let's go on to uh, director's report, Dave. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. I don't really have a direct report because we have such a comprehensive agenda, but I would say for the airports in the room, if you'd come back at uh, four, I think that's the right time. Uh, for the aeronautics update, I'm going to unpack House 1235 and talk in detail about what y'all can expect uh, from that. And then our partners, Kimley Horn, uh, will follow on with me to give an update on our economic impact. Yeah, that's so that's it. it. We'll be right here. Uh, let's go on to item seven. Uh, Bryce? Bryce? Thanks, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we'll go to the financials here. Uh, first slide uh, is our monthly revenue slide uh, for May. Uh, revenue came, or for April, I should say. These are April numbers. Uh, obviously, we kind of we don't have a final answer on that. So, reporting on April, uh, April revenue came in at 4.9 million, uh, which is 110 percent of forecast. 4.4, uh, uh, a little bit less than the previous year. Again, 4.9. So we're talking incremental. Uh, but overall, uh, the, the revenue is up. We're still planning on 57 million. Uh, for our revenue budget here for FY24. Uh, next slide, two look at our cash balance. And we ended the month with a cash balance of 27.6 million. Uh, that was an 832,000 increase from March. Uh, sorry, we decreased uh, 832,000. And the big part of that increase was the 2.5 million funds that we moved from the 60 count to the SIP. So, uh, in actuality, cash balance went up. We just moved some out uh, as we had been approved by the board meeting previously in April. Next slide. Uh, so, our tax expenditures by month, all the usual month to month trends, no other New York area uh, spikes or anything like that. We sent out 2.5 million in sales tax. 173,000 in abject uh, excess and uh, 1,000 in gas excess. Yeah. And looking at our contingency analysis uh, from the previous slide there, uh, we continue to show an extremely healthy cash balance, as you can see. Uh, with fuel prices in Denver at the time of the report of around 80 million barrel or eighty dollars a barrel, I should say. Uh, but we've been averaging 42 million gallons per month at Denver uh, so far in 2024. So it's continuing to continue to be exceptionally healthy there. As you can see, our cash on hand balance, yes, it looks high, but it is uh, basically covering all of our commitments that we have out right now through the end of next fiscal year. Uh, and that's with a, a grant program at $60 million for the current year and forecasting for next year at this point. Uh, we'll come back with more of an official number uh, to you in August uh, before we show up in town meeting. Uh, but yeah, overall cash balance uh, is acceptable. And the next one is on our administration expenses. Uh, state mandated cap of 5% on FY22 revenue gives us $3 million to play with there. We have actually approved 825000 for us for FY23. Uh, but year to date, uh, we've only expended 562000 on administration expenses. Uh, we do forecast to close a little north of 600000 uh, And that puts us at or right below 1% uh, of uh, the division spent on salary up to administration expenses. So we are nowhere near the state mandated cap to continue to operate uh, very lean and very lean. And then uh, Denver fuel flows month over month. Uh, it, I mean, it continues to kind of raise me every month that we get up here and say that we hit another record high uh, in, in April. Uh, so that's that's awesome. I was hoping to have them do the numbers from May yet this morning, but I don't. Uh, but April was 42.6 million dollars. Uh, that's one of the record. Uh, that's one of the uh, over March's numbers. Uh, and as you can see there, I, I mean, I always point to it. And I keep saying to you, when you look at the trend line, they're relatively static. It's just it's getting set at higher and higher numbers. But uh, month over month, the trends continue to compete. Uh, that also means that we're heading into June and July when, when we see kind of the, the cap of those. So uh, fuel flow continues to be exceptionally strong in Denver. And because of that, our, our revenue is kind of following a similar pattern as, as what we've been doing. And then the final slide is going to look at our cash balance allocation. So, current cash balance uh, here in the month is $27.6 million. 
And then we'll leave thousands of dollars just fund that thing and then this year we'll have the building expenses. Uh, a little over one million uh, for the cash flows to go initially because we don't have anything. And then uh, 5.4 million in seed expense. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, the next part here. And then, like you said, there's 20 million already allocated within the cash budget for existing grants, ones that are just going out the door uh, as part of this year's problem. Uh, but we are uh, in the range now where our, our reserve slice there, that one tiny double one, uh, it is in the positive. So we have. Uh, basically a million dollars on the hand more than what we have to pay down the way for the end of that one point five. And then we just move two point five million now for that would be higher, but that's that's effectively what we would have to to leverage uh, as much as we can uh, with mitigation in Colorado. So we we remain in uh, terrific financial shape. Uh, we were at a great spot. The other two stayed bigger. Uh, they remain anywhere from 70 to 75 percent of the division's revenue comes from sales tax at Denver. So that's obviously the one that uh, I watch like the hawk and forecast off of as well. As well as so. the aviation throughout the state is obviously picking up. That's actually real that percentage down a little bit in Denver. And that's why we continue to see uh, this sky high revenues. Uh, this will be our second largest year ever for a revenue in that fiscal year. That's the end of the dashboard there, but I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, okay, very good. Seven two, please. Okay, uh, seven two. This is already turned this way. And uh, <laughs> remind the uh, airports to leave the end of the state's fiscal year at the end of June. Uh, this is the one time of year I'm not going to say. Get your accruals in. Uh, we'll look grow. We'll get that. Uh, but we sent out an email last week. Uh, that we did our uh, office. And that is any work that's been done at the end of June. Uh, we need to have just that estimate yeah. from the airports uh, as well. And just giving us an idea how much uh, work has been done so that if you've got some payment for it in July, you can pay it. And if you don't send any accruals and ask for payment in July, it's going to sit in my inbox for a little while. I'm going to stay back to the place where we're going to go. That's our plea to you is to work with any of those in and make a balance of drawing down. Make sure that you pay your time back. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Chair Wilsoner and uh, members of the board. Uh, just a very quick grant administrative update for you. Uh, there are three airports that have established uh, new intern, uh, internship programs for 2024, and uh, subsequently they have been approved for a number of grants. The first one will be uh, Northern Colorado Regional Airport, who has been uh, approved for $21,840 grant to hire one individual for a 12 month airport management internship program. And we will provide 50% match on a $21 uh, dollar per hour wage. The next one is Grand Junction Regional Airport. They are receiving a $37,440 grant to hire two individuals to uh, complete uh, 12 month administrative and operations internship programs. And uh, they, we are supporting an $18 per hour wage for each of those employees. And finally, Aspen Pitkin County Airport it has been awarded an $11,960 grant to hire one individual for a six month uh, airport operations internship. And we are supporting a $23 uh, per hour wage. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Kit. Item seven four, Bryce Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, any questions for Bryce? This is just informational uh, for the board. Uh, just letting you know as we kind of wind up the fiscal year, a uh, year to date, uh, we have spent uh, a little over $473,000 of uh, the $892,867,000 uh, that you guys approved for the administration supplemental fund. Uh, that is an account that does go over. We don't push that on for the next year. You have already approved uh, $1 million for that fund in FY25. I just want to make sure an update that. Uh, we have ballpark about half of that that was spent this year. Uh, the rest will go later, and we'll start the next year with the, the one million, so we can accurately show how much is going down. So it is a little different than some of our other cost centers, but we just wanted to highlight that for you. Uh, and for those that don't know, that we well, just heard Kit give an informational update on the intern. This and his planning to uh, make quick uh, quick adjustments to grants that have already been approved still. 
that kind of cross over us. We know that it never happens, but uh, you know, it's a little bird sometimes like this. We're able to move pretty quickly uh, and frequently on that. So I just want to thank the board for that program. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Bryce. Item eight, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, we have before uh, the board today a motion, uh, a recommendation to approve CAB Resolution 2024-04, approving an aviation SIB loan application dated December 19, 2023, submitted by the Durango La Plata County Airport. Um, so you may recall that back in December, the airport submitted uh, an SIB application for an $8 million aviation loan to support uh, their next phase, 1B, of the airport's terminal expansion project, which includes uh, relocation of the TSA checkpoint, bigger baggage claim. I'm kind of paraphrasing some of this in the interest of time. New airline boarding gate and two in seating area, uh, post-TSA concessions, uh, expansion of airline ticket offices and kiosks, and the enabling of future solar uh, photovoltaic installation on standard roof lines. So in your packet was the link to the full application and an outline of the proposed work. Um, the $8 million of SIB loan proceeds will be combined with AIP, uh, FAA, AIP, and bipartisan infrastructure law grants, along with some CDAC grants from us and local funds for total project cost of $28,500 as shown on page 13. Um, you may recall that while the application was submitted in December, at that point, we did not have enough funds in the account to do an $8 million loan. So uh, we put Tony's loan in the queue, which is where it sat until now. But at this point, with the upcoming June payments on uh, outstanding loans from other airports and your approval in April of a $2.5 million transfer from the aviation fund to the SIB, there will be $8.36 million in the SIB fund when the loan is ready for contracting, presumably later in June. So we reviewed the airport's application in accordance with CDOT Directive 720.1. It's complete. It's in their capital improvement program. It is eligible. And the staff's recommendation is approval of the Durango SIB loan contingent upon review by the State Infrastructure Bank Loan Committee. Remember, that's part of CDOT's Division of Accounting and Finance that goes through the financial uh, verification, making sure Tony's a good credit risk and that he's got a good score. So we think he does. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that will be the next step. And you'll recall that that committee consists of myself. <laughs> Um, the the CDOT CFO, our SIB loan manager, and then Mr. Mantine is the designee uh, from the uh, Aeronautical Board. So that's the recommendation, uh, Mr. Chair, for approval of the $8 million SIB loan for the Durango uh, La Plata County Airport and approval of the current resolution 2024 04. And I do see Tony Vicari back there in the middle if you have any questions. Very good. Are there questions of Tony? Would entertain a motion to approve? So moved. No second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Very good. Okay, we'll go to item nine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, this is for the Aviation Education Workforce Development Grant Program um, grant app. Um, um, we, are seeking, we are seeking approval to award 14, 14 grant applicants, totaling um, um, $385,130.04. Um, the application period closed on May 1st um, with a total of 14 application, applications submitted. Um, Following review, staff worked with four of those to um, eliminate ineligible items and focus projects on uh, key initiatives to remain within the $400,000 budget. So uh, thankfully, we were able to do that for all 14 applicants. Um, as you can see in the chart, 11 of the applicants were from middle and high school, two are post-secondary, and one is in Air Force. So after review, staff recommends cap approval of all 14 applicants for a total of $385,130.04 in aviation education and workforce development grants as, as detailed, um, along with the accompanying resolution 2024-05. Very good. Any questions for Hedy? Would entertain a motion? So moved. 
Mr. Chairman, I will abstain from the vote as I'm involved with Colorado Skies Academy. Very good, thank you, Mike. And Mr. Terrell, I abstain as well. Thank you, David. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Very good. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Okay, let's go to item 10, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is one that uh, I think our team is really excited to bring before you today. Uh, you will recall that back in May of 2023, Centennial Airport became the first airport in Colorado to offer unleaded aviation fuel through Jet Centers of Colorado and the fixed, one of the fixed, fixed base operators uh, at Centennial. And this offering was really cool. It's one of the essential first steps in transitioning away from unleaded fuel for piston aircraft operating in Colorado. And at this moment, Centennial and Jet Centers uh, are making available UL-94, which is an unleaded aviation fuel developed by Swift Fuels. And later in the board meeting, we'll hear from Chris DaCosta, the CEO of Swift Fuels, who is here to give us an update on their progress on a 100 octane uh, unleaded fuel. Um, and as you all know, and as Mike has demonstrated at the airport, currently UL-94 has a higher manufacturing and distribution cost and it's being offered at a price um, higher than the existing 100 mobile uh, cost. So to help address that cost barrier to transition, uh, kudos to Mike Fronafel, the Arapahoe County Airport Authority, uh, and the team there. In 2023, they developed and implemented uh, a, an agreement with Jet Centers to implement a subsidy program. And it allows the FBO to provide the UL-94 fuel uh, to users at the same price as the current 100 low lead fuel. Um, and then the FBO would be reimbursed by the airport for the difference. So the end cost uh, to the user was the same. It was pretty innovative. Um, Mike, I think that was the first such program in the United States, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So kudos to you for taking the lead on that. That program has been really successful. Mike says that over 80% of the training aircraft operated at Centennial have been certified to use UL-94 safely. And through 2024, the airport uh, budgeted $380,000 of their own funds to support that program. So for us to help lessen the impact of this program on the airport and to support, as Mark said, our stated uh, support for transition to uh, unleaded fuels, we are proposing to, uh, or we have a new statewide initiative that will reimburse airports for that price difference so it doesn't come out of the airport coffers. Uh, and it would be a 90-10 grant with a max of $2 per gallon difference uh, with a cap of $300,000 for this particular grant from uh, the state. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, later, but House Bill 2435 was signed into law and became effective on May 17th. And one of the things that that uh, bill provided for is that we are now required for our next round of grants in 2025 is when that will start. Uh, but we're going to do this now uh, is that we have to allocate $1.5 million per year or 10%, whichever is less of our annual CDAC program to uh, programs that support a transition to unleaded oh, okay. gas. So this is allowing us to get right after the provisions of House Bill 1235, less than a month after it's been signed. And we're pretty happy. We're very happy with Mike's collaboration with us to make this uh, make this grant happen. And we were able to do that under the $16 million CDAC level that you all set previously for 2024. Um, I would also note that Section 3 of the House Bill clarifies that such transitional subsidy grants are indeed an eligible use a division grant funds and Barbara and her team at the AG's office have verified that for us kind and thank you very much. Um, so we are excited to do that. This certainly supports um, our requirements under House Bill 1235, as well as our strategic plan and our already stated goals from years ago to engage with industries to work on alternatively powered aircraft and things like that. So it, it's really a win-win for everybody. So our motion um, from staff is to approve the Centennial Airport CDAG application to provide reimbursement for an unleaded aviation fuel subsidy program to expedite the transition to unleaded aviation fuels at the airport and the associated resolution 2024-26. And I know Mike is here if anybody has any questions about that. I know some of the Jet Center folks were here previously. I don't know if they're in the room now, but uh, Mike, I'm sure we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dave. Questions for Mike? Would entertain a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, very good. Uh, let's move to item number 11. Dave. 
Well, just a quick recap. I think you all were here half an hour ago. Hopefully you're not all uh, have dementia like I do and forget everything 30 minutes later. But uh, our awards program this year again, uh, congratulations to Ken Lawson, our Aviation Professional of the Year. Uh, the Harriet Alexander Airport in Salida is our airport of the year. Uh, Mr. Mamba is a recipient of uh, my director's award this year. And again, it was just fantastic to see former Governor Romer and Senator Lewins here to receive uh, only the second time in the division's uh, history that we've awarded the CAP Lifetime Achievement Award to those two gentlemen. So you'll recall back in 2019, the previous recipient and the first recipient was Walt Barbo, Colorado aviation legend, still flying. We just ran into him. Last week outside, he was working on his airplane. So anyway, kudos to all of those folks for their awards. Thank you, Dave. Let's go to item 12. So quick update on our uh, division strategic plan. I think all of you that have been around long enough know that back in 2018, the division implemented its very first ever strategic plan to try to help guide and focus what we work on, where we invest our limited resources, what we tackle, what we don't tackle under the guidance of the board. You know, again, I say it all the time. We know we have to provide you all fuel tax disbursements. We know we have to have a grant program. We know we need to support aviation safety and education. All that's in statute. We know we have to do that. but. The way statute is drafted, it gives us a lot of latitude to do cool programs and having that strategic plan in place has been, I think, helpful for the board to know why we're working on things and why we're not working on some things. And certainly for myself as the director and our team, it allows us to focus our resources and make sure that we're doing things that that the board expects. Um, the 2021 update, uh, just like 2018, was developed collaboratively with our partners with FAA, CIOA, CABA, Colorado Pilots Association, the board, our team. So it really was a collaborative document that I think reflected the input of all of the folks that um, are our stakeholders that are important to how we operate. So uh, we have made a fantastic progress on our 21 uh, strategic plan. Uh, we have almost 15 of the 19 um, uh, work items in there, either complete or underway for them. And we decided uh, uh, they would either be combined or things that uh, that weren't necessarily feasible. Uh, one that did sort of fall by the wayside, unfortunately, uh, was we had been planning on partnering with AOPA to do a pilot passport program. And we learned a couple of weeks ago, AOPA is abandoning their platform for a pilot passport program. So now we're gonna carry that one forward and try to do something on our own. So. Um, we're very happy with that. I think one of the most notable things, and kudos to Todd Green for making this happen uh, in our strategic plan. If you were at our April meeting or tuned in, uh, you know that the board awarded an $85,000 grant to the State Division of Fire Prevention and Control to procure and manage a mobile aircraft rescue firefighting prop that will be usable, not just by the Part 139 airports, but all the airports in the state. That was actually a carryover from the 2018 plan, and we kind of went a bunch of different directions on how to make it easier for airports to get ARF training. And we finally were able to come up with a solution. Again, thanks to Mike and his team at South Metro that helped us inform some of that. But uh, that was a key part of the strategic plan win that we now have that in place. And we're often running to get that prop. And it's going to make, again, ARF training easier for everybody around the state. Not just airports, we have intentions to work with them to get that to small town fire districts and some of those folks that maybe don't know about aircraft rescue firefighting because they're not required to. So uh, that was probably the biggest win in the 2021 plan. But uh, with that, we are kicking off on a three year cycle with those. So again, Jeff Coleman, everybody knows, I think Jeff with the uh, uh, Aviation Management Consulting Group, we've again retained him and uh, his firm to facilitate the next update to our strategic plan. We're kicking that off as we speak right now. And so we'll look forward to engaging CAOA uh, again on that because you all are uh, our, our primary constituents of ours. So uh, look forward to that. If you're interested, our full strategic plan and all of our action plans, if you want to dig into what we're doing, we're on the website. Uh, if you have any questions about that, let us know. And as always, you hear from me all the time. If you have questions or you think we're doing something that we're um, not supposed to be doing or vice versa, let us know. We'll, we'll make that happen. So that's a quick update on the strategic plan. Thank you, Dave. Any questions? Let's move on to 12-2. Hetty? Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, this is just a quick uh, outreach update. Um, kind of a fun fact, the Colorado Division of Aeronautics is partnering with Colorado Pilots Association um, for Air Venture in Oshkosh. Um, that's July 22nd through the 27th. And we will present a Colorado Aviation booth there. So that'll be really exciting. We are in Hanger C, so if anyone's in there, please come by and say hello. Um, get some swag. <laughs> um, some uh, fun events that most recently that we attended um, 
where the uh, FTG CFO 40th anniversary celebration, um, that was a huge turnout. It was a fantastic event, as was the Centennial Air Force Runway 5K, which was so much fun. And we were highly sought after for all of our charts. So that was a fantastic event, um, really community oriented. Um, the list of events that are happening for the rest of the summer are way too long to list, so I am not going to do that. Um, but if you check out our aviation event calendar on our website, colorado-aeronautics.org, you can find out what's happening all around the city of Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Any questions? Let's move on to 12.3. Scott? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll leave this uh, very brief because as Dave mentioned, the Kimley Moore team is here and they're going to give an update during the division update session in here in a little bit. Uh, but the detailed requirements report for the month of May was included in the board packet. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about that at this point. Questions for Scott? Okay, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Uh, item 12, board, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick update from NREL. They had planned to be here uh, to give an update later today, but unfortunately, our NREL person had a family emergency and was not able to make it. But they're still working very closely with airports on data collection, on energy usage, and what the potential demand might be, specifically right now, focused on regional air mobility aircraft, not necessarily the flight training aircraft that will come uh, as in a subsequent step. But I wanted to give another shout out to Tony Vicari down in Durango. Um, NREL and their team has really really been leaning hard on his airport. They have got some of the best and most robust electrical usage data of any airport in the state, which no offense, Tony, that's a little surprising. We would have uh, we would have thought that would have been somebody else. But um, anyway, it's fantastic. He's been really helpful. And one of the things that we're starting to learn uh, that you'll get shared, we'll share with you in August at a more significant update is that um, it looks like in a lot of cases for some of our airports like Durango to accommodate the charging capabilities for regional air mobility aircraft, that can likely be done with a combination of increased solar and battery storage on the airport rather than significant off-airport grid upgrades. So that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, thing. And the other thing that those do, the batteries are kind of interesting. There's a pretty big battery and it lets you charge those either using solar um, or grid power at a time when it's a lot less expensive. And then you can use the power later on when uh, when the grid power is more costly. So very cool, a lot of data. I, I It's kind of hard to understand some of the charts, but uh, in August we'll have uh, the NREL team uh, in our meeting to give us a little more detail on where they are with that. So that's a quick update with the NREL study. With that, the data collection in some cases is taking a little bit longer than we had expected. It's no one's particular fault. It's just complicated information. Uh, so with that, we do expect that study to be released in the first quarter of 2025 rather than December of 2024 as we initially expected. Thank you, Dave. Questions? All right. 12.5, digital tower. Bill, Bill, Dave, Bill, Bill's here. We'll get you a mic. Well, he's already got the microphone. Oh, okay. yeah. So uh, real quick, since I've noticed on the thing, I'm no longer flying Tammy and Charlie. I feel pretty uh, pretty good about that. A quick update on the uh, digital tower project. Uh, we've got... Uh, Raytheon and Frequenta is coming to uh, FNL uh, next Thursday to discuss the, uh, their proposal. They have a, they made a uh, proposal to the Air Board. Uh, the technical part of it is 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 very good. Uh, there were a couple of things that we we had to discuss on that particular thing, and then uh, uh, the the financial end of it is. Uh, not not very uh, rewarding. So uh, I we made a, a proposal to them to come back with a different model for funding of that particular project, and uh, they've shown some interest in, in doing that. So uh, also uh, on, uh, on uh, Tuesday we had a meeting with uh, Civic and Economic Staff to discuss uh, the, uh, the Star Radar that is still at FNL. To make sure that they keep that, uh, that the FAA does not kind of matter. So, anyway, that's that's my report. Any questions, comments? No, no, we'll do it again. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's go to 12 6. Uh, Chris Acasa, please. 
Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. My name is Chris DeCosta. I'm the CEO of Swift Fuels. Swift Fuels are the premium suppliers of unlimited ad gas in the United States. Thanks for having me here. I have some help with my slides today. Go ahead. We've been selling unlimited ad gas across the United States for nine years. We sell a product today called UL94, which is inferior as a replacement for 100 low lead, but it's a way to kind of kickstart getting people going. We've been selling it, as you can see, in the across the Midwest and in the Northeast, down Florida, Texas. Thank you, Colorado, particularly Centennial in Colorado. Big shout out for you guys. Uh, Utah White School, we have now, we had 17 Abigails in California. We have 22 now. Uh, a lot of growth in California, but the same kind of political pressure that you're having in Colorado. There's a lot of regulatory, state regulatory threats and so forth. So we're working on a variety of ways to accelerate the deployment, particularly for places that may not have temporary tankage uh, from 94 product. So if you need help there, just give us a call. We have ways to do that. Next slide. I should point out, sorry, one, one second. So what makes you a 94 unique, go back one second, is the the little empty corner says FAA certificated. You, you have to have permission for the engine and the airframe for the fuel. And secondly, you have to have ASTM International specification. This is D7547. Those two things are what you need to bring the fuel to the commercial marketplace of the United States. Now you can go. We've had that for 94 for these last nine years. So we're working on the certificates with that with 100 r product and we're working on the ASTM work that's all happening now it's well down the road now and that's coming out soon so our plan is to turn off ul94 and transition into 100 r the 100 octane replacement fuel for low lift that'll be happening in the months ahead everybody wants to know exactly when and i want to know that too uh, but it takes coordination with the faa and with ASTM, and we're working on that now my prediction is that by 12 months from now, 94 will largely be out of the national market. And sometime between the end of this year and the early first quarter of next year, we'll see 100 R start to play its role in taking a 94 out of the market. That's my current expectation. I, I do not control the FAA and I do not control ASDM. So I try, but I don't succeed. Next. So our fuel 100R, it's a full 100 octane replacement for low lead. I, I, I didn't call these out on the last slide, but what our fuel does not have is an octane booster, an octane booster that contains MMT. MMT is a manganese product. MMT tends to particulate and precipitate out of the fuel when it's exposed to sunlight in certain instances, just in a matter of minutes, a short few minutes. And we see that as a, a lack of stability. It also creates a lot of deposits, even more than lead, in the combustion chamber, which is a big negative. So we're concerned about that. We're, we have our own reasons. We're, we're an R&D firm, so we care about finding solutions that, are, that the industry is going to want. So it's not stable, and we're not going to use MMT. Our fuel does also not contain aromatic amines. <clears throat> These are aggressive solvents. They're known in the industry. These are pictures from the FAA of testing a means where it has disturbed sealants, caused leaks, created uh, concentrations of a heavy product, which ultimately disturbs paint and, and fibers in the aircraft and things like that can create damage of all sorts of elastomers and things like that. So we're concerned about that and we're not allowing those products in our fuel. Next slide. So, in reality, the, the market for unleaded avgas is only big enough for one fuel. There will probably not be, I don't think there will be two or three or any more than that kind of fuel. So the market, the global market, wants one fuel. It's partly because of tankage. It's partly because of supply chain issues. I see fuel over here, and maybe there's some other distributors in the room. It's very challenging in such a low market as avgas to have enough capacity and not follow something. So it's it's a one market, it's a one fuel market. That's the message. Next. Uh, the comment earlier on the grant assurances, I'm just gonna echo what he what this gentleman up here said a few minutes ago. Uh, sorry, the reauthorization bill in general. The first one says grant assurances. So if you're receiving federal money for grant insurance, 
much like what Reed Hill Newton sort of was doing, but they, maybe they weren't doing, I don't know. Uh, the rules say, you, the new rules say, signed by Biden, you can't remove low lead until 2030 unless you have a replacement fuel that has an FA certificate and an industry consensus standard. And that's why I called out those two things on the first slide. An FA certificate is one thing, but an industry consensus standard is another thing that we use in ASTM. And those are required for the replacement fuel. In 2020, uh, Alaska, Alaska also petitioned for an extension to 2032. That doesn't affect you, but it affects me. He mentioned the AIP funds, the trust fund, is available as a subsidy for what is a grant for uh, unleaded aircraft, that gas infrastructure. Um, that is unique in this sense that it's allowed, it applies to revenue generating infrastructure. It didn't, it doesn't normally, but in the case of unleaded app gas, they're allowing it to be applied to revenue generating infrastructure. Finally, there's a thing called Eagle. They have their whole play in the transition. They've been empowered through the FA administrator to continue their work, and that's going to continue. So this just re-fortifies the message. There's this eagle thing that's coordinating, but they don't have any real authority other than the authority that exists within the FAA to certificate engines and airframes and aircraft, and the authority within ASTM to issue standards for fuels on a global scale. Next. Primers up with fast. Quick pictures, you can do them every 10 seconds. This is us testing our 100 R fuel. We've got Big test engines. These happened months ago. We got scientists uh, working extensively hard on getting all the results out. FAA approved. FAA is with us at every step. Next, uh, we have sophisticated automation. How we monitor this? We're running well above the minimum standards of, that are legislated by Congress. To how to test an engine? Normally, it's a 150-hour engine test. This one, but we're taking it way further than that. Our tests go 400 hours, not 150 minutes. So after 400 hours, we tear them down, we look at them, we diagnose, you know, and the, the, basically they're all within wear limits, equal to low lead. So it's a very sophisticated, highly stressful process we go through and, and we're seeing positive results. Next, same thing, exhaust valves, perfectly fine, intake valve, exhaust valve, 400 hours way above the normal minimum standard by the FAA. Next, spark plugs look clean. They were untouched after 400 hours, which is remarkable. Normally you clean your spark plugs after every 50 hours to get the lead off. We didn't clean these for 400 hours and they're almost, they're the way they should be, almost new. One of the things I should have pointed out that makes 100R different and special, and in light of what happened at UND, uh, we, our field has an anti-valve seat recession additive. It's special, it's unique, and it's proprietary swift, and it prevents valve seat recession. So those slides that you saw, it had no valve seat indications, the spark plugs you need, that's all evidence to the FAA that our anti-valve seat recession additive is working. This is our flight test team. They recently flew in-flight restarts, bomb landing, uh, hot starts, all that sort of thing, came out in flying colors, it's all been successful. ASTM is complicated. It's a big, long set of things. And when people say, I don't, I'm not going to worry about that, they're making a big mistake. It's very complex. I can't go into it here, but I'll show you on the next slide. There's 150 things you have to do to satisfy ASTM. Who is ASTM? That's the next slide here. This is my task force at ASTM. It's made up of red dots, which are international oil and gas companies, BP, Chevron, Phillips, uh, Exxon Mobil, Shell, uh, and the list goes on. Mine Del Cell, Marathon Oil, Nesty Oil in Sweden, uh, Valero, etc. All major integrated oil and gas companies send their ad gas representative to this forum. Who else? The Green Dots, uh, Lycoming Engines, Continental Engines, Cirrus Aircraft, Extron Aviation, and so on. Distributors, Ad Fuel, World Fuel, all of these. Groups send their ad gas experts to ASTM, and they're the due diligence. They're the they're the people you have to convince that your deal is going to work to those 150 standards you saw from the earlier slide. So it's a it's a rather involved thing. And when people say, "Ah, don't worry about that," that's a giant mistake. 
It's a defect. And somebody who says that is wrong. And now the legislation signed by Congress says you have to have an FA certificate and you have to have an industry consensus standard. And this is the consensus standard, the ASTM fuel standard. Next. So SWIFT, we've done all this work. We've turned it into the FA certification office. We've turned it into ASTM. They're both, the buns are in the oven, okay? They're working on it. They're, you know, I don't control the process they go through, but I can tell you that if it's an FAA, uh, the lower two paragraphs here, these are all FAA required tests, which means FAA conforming, but we did above and beyond minimum industry standards. They've been FAA approved, but now they go to the certification desk and ASTM. So there's already a, an approval in hand, but I need to get these two things finished. And then the other things are also, they're not FAA, but they're required by ASTM to get done. They're done too. Thank you. So we'll finish the certificates, we'll finish the specification, and we'll be in business for the, for the 100 octane fuel. So you see that we're, we're saying we're going to be market ready with FAA and ASTM in the next six to 18 months. It's going to take time to push that into the market. Uh, it'll fully replace low lead on a global scale. It's commercially viable. The globe, the countries around the globe will find the value of our chemistry because some chemistries don't work. And oh, by the way, we have an AD valsic recession added to prevent any problems. Next. So from today, We've got six years and six months. We'll have the fuel in place within 18 months. So, you know, if I'm wrong, it's 19 months. If I'm wrong, it's 20. We're going to be well ahead of six years and six months. Next. If you want to take a picture of that, uh, scan that, you can find the link. To it. it has several things on our website. Let me know if that works. All right. I got a thumbs up. So you use your, your camera, you look at that, and it gives you a link to several of our websites. So that's what, an easy way to get that out there. Thank you very much for your time. We're leading the pathway to a lettuce solution on a global scale. Thank you. Chris, thank you. Any questions for Chris? Mark? Do we have a couple questions? Yes. Uh, I'm going to start with Mark. And Chris, if you, if you take a look at the long game, I mean, you know, economies of scale are, um, are, are key here. And of course, you know, it would be great from last as a challenge. But you know, as you look long term, you know, what's your, what's your view and estimate of what the cost of, of your product is going to be compared to what? The industry is paying today for low level. Well, any I've been to the I'll tell you what. So I graduated in college in 1980. I've been in the oil and gas business for 44 years. Um, every time I've been asked to predict the oil price, I've always said the same thing. I don't know what it's going to do tomorrow. So oil is under stress, coal's under stress, oil's under stress, and prices are probably in the oil markets are probably going to go up. So if you're comparing me to yesterday's low lead price to Long term, what's going to happen? All gasolines are probably going to go up a little bit, up some, not down, probably all. And so, um, the lead that's in low lead is a finite resource made in one or two places in the world, and people are concerned about the supply security of that. So, what if that goes away? Um, we're looking at it from a holistic international market of hydrocarbons that affect the majority of our fuel and an oxygenate that's a sister to ethanol that's also in our fuel that has the oxygen burns cleaner, makes the exhaust cleaner, and it gives an enhancement to the fuel. So are those things going to be astronomically expensive? I don't know, but they're not going to be out of order from hydrocarbon markets today. That's what I would say. Thank you. It's probably not going to be cheaper, but it's not going to be, I can't gauge the, the expense of it, you know? So, it, one last thing, the, the distribution of it, like I point to Abdul over here, that part is the same. I mean, it's the heart, one of the biggest chunks of the cost to your airports is the distribution right. to get it there. 
So if I'm finding strategically sophisticated producers that'll help me, and they're East Coast, Gulf Coast, West Coast, and other parts of the world, if I'm efficient in how I bring it to you, then it's going to keep the cost down. And that's what I'm working on today myself. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question that uh, Mark asked the one about the price point, right? Part of that's going to be driven by how 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 your production facilities are located and how much production you you can you know. We all know you're not going to be any any forecast of costs is going to have to start out once upon a time. Yeah. The bigger question, which you may have answered, is: Are you when you get your 100 R approved and 19 months, 20 months, whatever. Uh, are, are aircraft owners going to have to get an STC for that fuel? My fuel comes with an STC. Okay, my STC costs $100. I've been selling it for all these nine years. If people buy the STC one time for $100, all my future regulatory things, including 94, 100R, and anything else, comes with it at no extra charge. So if you put up $100 today, or you know, if you put up $100 from my SEC, you're getting all my future requirements taken care of at no extra charge. When my $100 rolls out, we send you the stuff free because you've already paid for the STC. The, the, SEC, by the STC question is, is uh, understand that the cost, which is, yeah. I'm not gonna say it's, it's non-trivial, but uh, are you gonna have to show if I fly from my airport to some other airport and get fuel, am I going to have to show an STC? Am I going to have to keep one in the airplane? I, I think I, uh, I think that's an airport question more than it's a me question. No, I think it's a I think all air, individual airports aren't going to be having to make that, yeah. that call. From, from Swift Field standpoint, if you have the STC and it's sold at point A and it's sold at point B, you compensated us through the STC for that. <laughs> So, so you know, you know, the question is, does point A demand you show your STC, and does point B demand you show your STC? I'm not calling for that. Well, okay, but when, when 100 low lead goes to 100 low lead mm -hmm. and heaven, yeah. my, there's only, only, only uh, 100 R or whatever, Yes. then the STC becomes a moot point, right? I mean, because nobody can fly without... Okay. So the position that you're asking me a politically sensitive question, you may not realize it. So my position is that our STC is an official certificate from the FAA, which speaks to an engine and an airframe being approved for that fuel. And that's what I have negotiated with the FAA. And I've earned the right from the FAA to disclose that. So if you have a tail number and the engine and airframe correspond to what's approved by the FAA, you're good. No matter where that fuel is sold, you're good. And then, you know, so there's, there's, you're asking kind of a transitional question. It's going to take time for everybody to get in sync. My advice would be pilots buy the STC. Now, that's a marketing statement. I apologize. But the more people that cover that base now, get it over with. And then figure out where is the fuel going to be deployed. And as, as it's deployed, you'll be okay. You'll be, you'll be in a position to buy the fuel. Well, maybe you'll be in a position today to give us a discount. <laughs> since you're, since you're, <laughs> All right, we're, we're going to have to move to our next slide. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll, we'll be looking for a coupon from Sweden. <laughs> Item 13. Dave? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just keep this real quick. As uh, Mark alluded to earlier, we have a five-year FAA reauthorization bill, but I don't want to steal any of John Sweeney's thunder because I think I'm uh, as excited as all of you are to see how he makes 1,069 pages of FAA reauthorization language entertaining and humorous like he always is able to do. So uh, we'll look forward to him talking about that tomorrow. Uh, and then again, uh, please, at 4 o'clock, if you're an airport, tune in. I'm going to run through the real specific details of House Bill 12. 35 and how they're going to impact you and how we're going to go about making sure that we as a division are compliant with that. So uh, stay tuned. That's it. Great. Item 14. And then just the last thing, proposed calendar, uh, Mr. Chair, our next uh, uh, annual cap staff workshop is in our offices on Tuesday, August 20th. 
regular cab meeting the next day on August 21st, and then uh, our Wednesday, October 9th, regular meeting is at a location to be determined. We've typically taken that one on the road. You were in Burlington last October. So we'll uh, check with all of you and see what you think about uh, maybe going and visiting an airport and getting up to speed on something. So uh, one of the things I might plan to see with you on that real quick is I know you had all expressed an interest in a tour of NREL. And they have said they might be able to use it, let us use a conference room for a meeting uh, from NREL and get a tour of what they're doing with sustainable aviation. Very cool. Questions for Dave? Okay, item 15. Oh, Trinity? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Kelly. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> Anything from you, Kelly? All right, sorry about that. Uh, just a real quick uh, ledge update. Oh. Thanks. Good. See you there. Um, uh, in terms of ledge updates, Dave's going to handle 1235, which was, of course, the biggest uh, uh, bill we had this year. Totally something with Colorado Aviation Business Association, by the way. I probably should have started with that. Um, I'm sure Dave will do a fine job with 1235. Uh, Two other bills I just want to uh, mention, uh, 1036, that was a tax exemption bill. Every year the legislature goes through existing tax exemptions and recommends some for appeal that aren't being used. This year, two uh, aviation related ones were on the chopping block, the flyway exemption and the parts exemption. We did get those pulled off, so we still have those exemptions. So that was good news for the industry. And uh, finally, 1309, uh, helicopter search and rescue uh, bill. What it does is provide some liability protection for uh, helicopter pilots that volunteer for search and rescue operations in high country and requires uh, sheriff's departments and public safety to do uh, aerospace deconflection. So we were uh, happy to support that as well. And as always, if anybody has any questions, um, uh, I'm always happy to uh, talk to anybody. And the COP is always happy to work with uh, their Knox division and uh, on 1235, just want to say that uh, uh, where the bill ended up is not at all where it started, and it was a tremendous effort on from all of our partners in aviation, uh, statewide, national, and in particular, this gentleman here who did a, a hell of a job in uh, helping us get that down to something that's where it is today. So thank you for that. You're here. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, um, item 15. Uh, Public comment? Kevin, can you hear us? Yes, is this an invitation for public comment? Is this my opportunity for okay. public comment? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Yes, it is. Perfect. There's a. I'm catching a little bit of an echo, so maybe if there's a, you all may need to mute your microphones. I don't know. I'll leave it to you. That's resolved. We can hear. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to make public comment this afternoon. My name is Kevin Ryan. I live in the town of Superior. I'm a former trustee with our town and have expressed interest as a candidate for the aeronautical board for the two additional seats that are available as a result of House Bill 1235. I'm sorry I was not available to attend in person today as, as I wanted to. Ironically, I had some travel delays coming out of Denver Airport and would not have made it up the bail in time. I'm attending today for two reasons. Number one, to introduce myself and to learn a, lit, a, a little bit about what about these meetings and your agendas. And second, to inquire about the impact of House Bill 1235 signed by the governor just a couple of weeks ago on May 17th. As you know, the bill contain, contains a provision requiring attestation of compliance to easement agreements in each grant application. I won't read the language, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, again, just certifying and writing that the grant application uh, is compliant to all easements with uh, um, impacted communities. As a resident of Superior, my home has a navigation agreement in place, which I'm happy to share if you'd like a copy, and there is no ambiguity that the airport is not in compliance. 
You may have heard that in Superior, there were some of these easements have been vacated by the courts. Uh, mine remains, and I estimate about two thirds of the homes in town also have remaining easements. An exchange, the easement simply says, in exchange for our acknowledgement of noise and vibration, Rocky Mountain Airport, and the airport authority agrees to a series of conditions, including certain noise corridors, restrictions on expansion, and limitation of certain types of aircraft, all memorialized in a home title document that will convey if and when I sell my house. On Tuesday of this week, Jefferson County approved a memo to this board seeking your assistance related to three grants in what was ultimately determined through Jefferson County Resolution CC24-161. Their request was silent on whether or not the airport authority is attesting to compliance with existing easements. I'm unclear if this was an oversight on their part or um, this was something that was intentional. And I'm looking for input from both Jefferson County and this board. Uh, as some, as a previous uh, speaker just indicated, multiple stakeholders came together in support of House Bill 1235, and I'm eager to see how airports and adjacent communities can find a level of compatibility. Compliance with easements is an important element of, uh, of this. I don't see um, this particular grant request on, on your agenda today, um, and hopefully this afternoon as you're talking about the impact of 1235, you'll provide guidance to airports on how that attestation should look on a go forward basis. Presumably the ones that I referred to from the Jefferson County meeting this Tuesday will be on the agenda for your meeting next month. Thank you again for the opportunity for public comment. And uh, this has been a, a great learning experience. Thank you. Remarks. Uh, Dave, did you have any questions? Yeah, I was just clarifying. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, uh, the grants that Mr. Ryan is referring to for Rock Metro, one was a Fed bad match for uh, the other unleaded aviation fuel uh, infrastructure. That grant was approved by the board on April 18th. We only showed two in the mix right now, so we have to figure out whether there's going to be the rest between two and three. three. The other one was approved by the CAB in January of 2023 and 2024. That was the state law grant. For pay payment, payment based on runway three, three, three zero left, left and one two right. right. Um, um, both of those applications were received uh, well before well House Bill twenty thirty five in effect. So, so they, are they are not subject to the application easement uh, uh, disclosure statement that's required. required. All grants that are applied for uh, uh, that program after the ACT will be subject to that. And we're going to talk to all of you about how we ensure that that box is checked. When the airports that are required to do that, it will not be every airport in the state, uh, the way the bill is written. Uh, we'll make sure that our team does that for all grants going forward, that those grant applications predated the effective date of the bill, so they're not subject to those provisions. And I might just add that uh, it, it's a fundamental tenet of law that legislation not be retroactive, that uh, uh, something that passes uh, July 1, 2024 doesn't affect uh, matters that come before. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'd like to just uh, recognize uh, we, we lost a friend in aviation um, who passed away, Bob Loney, uh, in May. And uh, he was a former um, longtime management at uh, BJC is a Jeffco Airport, and as well as uh, the Division of Aeronautics, and then he came back, and I got had the opportunity to work with him for uh, about three years, and uh, he was just a, a remarkable man, and he loved aviation, and I uh, just wanted to take that moment and recognize uh, what a wonderful man he was. Thank you, Kim. Anything else? And we are hereby adjourned. Thank you all. Yeah, nice job. Right on top. Oh, nice job. 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 Nice job.
I wanted to say thank you on behalf of uh, Eagle Aviators. You bet. I'm sorry. <laughs> they move quick, man. Yeah. Sorry, we appreciate it. We look forward to working with you on that. So that's cool. You know, all these folks, David. How are you? Ken, Sure. Yeah, no, so don't have to Right. Get out of here. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.